Whitney Houston's nickname was The Voice. That's what they called her. Her whole life, she was called The Voice. And then Whitney Houston, through whatever it was, whether it be through abuse or whether it be simply by the natural course of aging, The Voice begins to change. And so what happens when The Voice can't sing anymore? What darkness lies on the other side of that when all you've ever known yourself to be is The Voice? I'm not The Voice. I'm Jason, my mama's son, who writes for a living and who writes um, because he loves it, but not because it is attached to his identity. No, 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 because one day I may have nothing else to say. One day uh, I might want to try something. You know, I love furniture, Chase. I might want to become a furniture designer. I might want to put my stories in physical objects, right? Create new narrative around what it takes to make something from a piece of wood in these hands. It might not be words on the page anymore. All right, Jason Reynolds, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Happy to have you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. It's good to be here. So I love to start off each of these shows with a request, and the request is a simple one. It's uh, for the handful of, for, first of all, congratulations on your most re recent book. Oh, Total genius. Never seen anything like it. Uh, but before we get to that, people... I guess they now gather you're an author because uh, I gave that away. But for anyone who might not be familiar with your work, I'm wondering if you can orient us around how you spend your time, what your focus is, your energy as a, as a creator. Um, how, how do you put yourself in time and space here for our audience? Uh, you know, I, I consider myself a, it's funny, my, my trade is writing. I consider myself a storyteller. The, the specificity of said trade is, at this particular juncture, writing for young people, even though I've written for adults and for everybody, because stories don't really have ages um, and age limits and, and, and requirements. Um, but but ultimately, if I had to whittle it all down, you know, just a raconteur, man, I'm just somebody who really <laughs> believes in the power of narrative, really believes in the power of story. Um, uh, of, of course, there are other parts to that, right? Like, I believe in the, the necessity for literacy, uh, I believe in the value of owning one's personal story uh, as a bridge to uh, the acknowledgement and appreciation of our sort of collective stories. You know, like that's really at the, at the, at the heart of it all, what I'm interested in. What, what made you, uh, if storytelling, I mean, humans, obviously we're storytelling creatures, right? We're social animals. We have a desire to understand, to fit in, to, to try and piece things together, even sometimes when it doesn't make sense. Why the focus or why have you been, you know, you said you've written for all sorts of audiences because storytelling is the, the craft, but why have you gravitated towards writing, especially, you know, some of your most recent books mm -hmm. towards a younger, a younger audience? Why, why that focus? I think that, I mean, I'm, there are a few reasons. I think some selflessly and some selfishly, right? I think selflessly, I, 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 in, in my mind, there's no greater population to write for. I, th I think we'd all agree that to convince um, and encourage young people that there's, that there's something precious about reading and writing, so they, that there's something valuable about spending some time with a good story can, in fact, enrich their lives um, in ways that I'm not sure we always give enough credence to, right? I, and, and it's not just about you know you, you'll hear this thing where it's all about empathy. This is sort of the this is sort of the the canned answer about like if you if you write books for kids, then kids will learn empathy. Maybe, right? We we really don't know if that's true, right? We this is what we all say because it's a good thing to say, and we all like to sort of put ourselves on these strange pedestals that, like we're like our work is sort of uh, a, a lot more, um, you know, it's almost like we, we create like piety around our work in these interesting ways that like I, I'm not monastic, right? That's not what's happening. Um, I'd like I, I hope that they encourage empathy, but even more so than that, I think that the the act of reading uh, teaches young people and teaches all of us persistence and discipline and consistency. Um, it, it, it gives us vocabulary. And the more vocabulary we have, the more ability 
we have to live autonomous lives. Um, it teaches young people to listen to themselves, how to hear one's own voice. Uh, it, it continues to keep the imagination fruitful and firing, uh, which we all know as adults, it tends to, we, we tend to lose that if we're not careful, if we're not fighting for it every day. And so those are the things I'm thinking about beyond just the ideas around empathy and representation, right, which are true and are very real things. But I think uh, we, we get a little lazy when we talk about this by just saying like, oh, because I want to be representative. I want kids to see themselves in stories and I want them to gain empathy. And so, yes, 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 yes. And also this is sort of the mechanism that creates whole, whole individuals. Uh, now, mm-hmm. on the selfish side, because it's fun. <laughs> because it's fun. I love it. Yeah, it's a lot more. And there's fun. nothing wrong with claiming that and owning that. That's yeah, I think that's fun. what I was. It's a good time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so uh, you said something in that moment that I want to grab onto, and that is like understanding our own voice. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the things that you want. Uh, that you, it was, seems suggested that you want younger people to remember that they have a voice and to know how to use it and articulate through vocabulary and you know standing standing in their space. Mm -hmm. And I heard a story about you and the relationship that you had with your mother, which I think is expressly resonant with our audience, because whether you're a kid listening to this show, or let's say you're 63 years old, trying to move on to a different uh, career, different stage of your life, and or even reinventing one's self, this idea that we all have a voice and that that is the thing that we need to own. You've talked a lot about owning that. Yeah. Um, given that that is so important for the creative, creative audience that listens to the show, watches the show, I heard a story about your relationship with your mother mm-hmm. where you were essentially, I don't know if allowed is the right word. You can, you can <laughs> tell me, Jason, but it may be even encouraged to have a dialogue with her, even – I think talk back was yeah. the word that I heard you say. And I, I was fascinated by this. And I think every single person should pay close attention to this because if you are working to capture your voice as a creator, that this is fascinating and important. I'm wondering if you can share that story. Yeah, I was I was raised by this incredibly progressive and creative woman, uh, creative in her parenting. Uh, she lived a very sort of pragmatic life outside of that, but but a very creative woman when it came to her parenting and the way that she looked at parenting and the world for that matter. And so she allowed us, my brother and I, but expressly me to talk back, which is a no-no for many of our fam- for our family dynamics. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's the it's the whole thing like, well, I'm your mother or I'm your dad and I say the thing and you do what I tell you to do and that's that, right? And and I don't want to I don't want to poo-poo on that, right? I think that there is there is something about that that's probably pretty healthy in certain ways, in certain ways too. But for my mother, she felt like it was totally okay for me to disagree with anything she said to me. Not only was it okay, it was human. It was healthy, right? It meant that I had my own mind. Which is what she was raising me to have. So you can't you can't raise a child to have their own voice and then tell them not to use it, as it pertains to sort of you. And so my mother would say things to me like, "Oh, you know, I'm upset with you because you did this, that, and the third. And I was allowed to say, and encouraged to say, "Well, yes, I did that, but I don't know if the way that you're disciplining me is fair. I, I think you're being a little harsh, or I feel like you're talking to me in a way that I'm not sure is warranted." you know, uh, in, in my six-year-old language, right? Or, and, and my mother would take a beat and she'd say, well, I agree or I disagree. Um, and I would sometimes still be in trouble. And then other times she'd say, you know what? You're right. I'm Maybe I have been a little harsh or maybe I am being a bit mean because I'm tired from work because of the things adults have to handle. And, you know, that kids don't always, that it's not always fair that they bear the brunt of. Uh, or she'd say, well, look, argue your, argue your case. State your point. But if you state your point, you got to state it confidently. So if you're going to argue with me, you're going to debate me on this or something that I'm calling you out on, then you got to sort of lift your chin and roll your shoulders and you got to say that thing like you mean it. Make me believe you. Uh, and this is the way that we communicated in my, in my, in my household. Um, and the beauty of it, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Chase, the beauty of it, as I got older, is that I believe that my voice belonged in any room that I was in. 
Mm. And not only did I believe that, but I was unwilling to let anyone muzzle it. I think I think sometimes when we tell kids that they're not allowed to talk back or that they can't ask inappropriate questions, what we do is we we subconsciously and implicitly and explicitly for that matter, muzzle their curiosities, let alone their humanity. What a gift. What a gift. I don't I, I, I mean, I'm not a parent, so I'm the funkle. I'm the fun uncle for everybody. Me so too. So it's a great man. role. Me too. Shout out to the fun uncles. Man. <laughs> Shout out to all the fun uncles out there. Uh, and and I don't think I've ever heard of someone being parented like that. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, implicitly or subtly, that, that subtext may have existed in a relationship between a parent, mm-hmm. but never overtly. Like, if you're going to talk back, that's fine. We're going to have a conversation and you have to state your point clearly. Mm -hmm. I can't even like, how do you feel like that's rippled through your life today? In addition to just knowing that you belong in whatever room you're in and your voice is that, first of all, is that something that you would encourage? There's parents listening right now for sure. I mean, is that a slippery slope? Is that a, you know, is there advice to give or is it all upside for the child. I, I personally think it's all upside if it's framed around respect, not mm-hmm. just the child respecting you, but also you respecting the child. Um, my mother made it very clear. Remember, I'm your mom, right? So you could say whatever you need to say, but remember, you're talking to your mother. I am your mother, right? <laughs> right. There was never any blurring of the line when it came to her role in my life. And it wasn't like, Oh, I'm I'm going to come down and sort of try to pretend to be more of your friend. It was like, no, 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 I'm your mother, but that doesn't mean that you're any less of a human mm-hmm. because of this sort of like archetype of our relationship, right? The, like you're still a person with with a range of emotions and feelings. And so I would encourage any parent to try this and to do this. I think that as long as you frame it around and you couch it in respect, I respect you, you respect me. If there's something you want to say, you can say it. If you want to disagree, you can disagree. Now, I also have the right to not change my mind, mm-hmm. but you can definitely express yourself. You, why, why would mm-hmm. we try to stop this, right? So what does this look like? How does this help me in my, in my life beyond sort of knowing that, I can, that I'm a person and I'm a person all the time and I can be a person in any space I'm in, in any room I'm in, and I can agree or disagree? I think it has also helped me process my emotions. It's mm-hmm. taught me to process my thoughts. It's taught me to sort of really distill uh, and 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 synthesize what's happening in my body, what's happening in my mind, um, without fear that the way I feel is is shameful or or silly or sophomoric, right? I don't feel that way ever. Mm-hmm. I I feel like my feelings are my feelings. My feeling, and, it, and it's that simple, but that's because my mother gave me space to feel and to express the fact that my feelings are my feelings. You can feel how you feel, son. Say what you need to say to me, and feel how you need to feel. And if I think you're, if I think that you have, ple- if you have, you have stated a case that should be overturned, I will overturn it out of respect and love for you. And if I feel that as your mother, I have to hold the line here, I will explain that to you, and I'll hold the line, and we'll and we'll engage as people. Right, like if we, that, could take that, if we could take that and do that everywhere, Chase, the world would be a better place. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. My mind is just like this is, this is like the highest order of human existence right here. So how, what, what, how did that manifest in your relationship with your mom and other areas? And the way that I'm, I'm actually excavating my my goal with this sort of line of questions is excavating how you have been able to stand in your space and put the kind of work out there in the world mm-hmm. that is progressive and different and confident. And these are all attributes that I think any, you know, creator, entrepreneur, anyone who wants to build something and put it out in the world, mm. these are these are the fundamental building blocks. I'm trying to excavate how you yeah how you got how you got this. Yeah. I, I you know I think I think between the two of us, my mother and I, I think it also um I think I also watched it create, those moments created glue for us. Mm. Those moments were the adhesive 
that bonded us. It's an amazing thing to not fear your parent. It's an amazing thing to love them. My mother always taught me, she said, Jason, the decisions that you make, you must make out of love and never fear, right? Which means that even the conversations that I have with my mother are conversations out of love and not fear. Imagine not having to fear your parent, right? Just I, I, I get to just love them. I get to make a decision and say the thing that I'm going to say. And yes, there may be some frustration there, but there's no fear. There's no fear. So, so like that, so that becomes an adhesive that binds a relationship, which means that I have a very early example of how relationships are formed. Relationships are formed through intimacy. Relationships are formed through trust and communication, through giving of oneself, trusting that the person's going to be able to hold it. Right. And I think, I think, you know, when I write my books and I do my work, that's all I'm ever thinking about. I live by three very simple rules that, that I got out of those conversations with my mother, humility, intimacy, and gratitude. If I can, if I can put those things in a book, then they will connect with people in the same way that if I can put them, if I can put them in the conversations between my mother and I, they will connect the two of us. If I can give them to you, Chase, in this moment, they will connect the two of us. It's a very simple humans are not that are not we're actually not that complicated. Mm -hmm. Right? You give me a little, I give you a little. Right? Now, usually we look we think about giving as, as bartering goods and things of that nature. No, no, no. If I give you a little of me then you'll feel more comfortable of giving me a little of you. Uh, if I'm humble enough to apologize, then you'll be humble, then, then, then you'll be confident enough in my humility to trust me, right? And, and if I value you enough simply by your existence to be grateful for you, then you will feel big in the world and be grateful for me. It's basic. This is all very, to me, this is, this is easy math. And these are all the things that were happening at the kitchen table of my mother's house as a child, as we suss out whether or not I agree or disagree with 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 with, with what she's trying to teach me. <laughs> all right, here's the here's the big leap. I get that at the dinner table in an area of trust, communication, value, mm -hmm. um, love, empathy, all these words, you connection, all these words you've used. But little Jason has to go to school. Sure. Right. So how does the rest of, uh, or how do those values stand up? Whether, yeah. how do they, how do they, how do they affect you in life? You show up and you can talk back to the adults in your life and <laughs> you stand in your voice. And from what I understand, you were uh, a couple years ahead in school. So you were smaller, younger. Yeah, I'm seeing some some setup for some problems. Yeah, and and they came, <laughs> they came. You know, you know, you know. But 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 you know, I think my mother. I think you know, it's interesting, right? Because those problems did come. I I I, I dealt with all the things that one deals with, whether it be the bullies, and and then you have to adjust, and 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 so you become something that you're not just to stay with the bullies off, and um. I wasn't that good in the struggle. I struggled in my grades and, you know, you, you discipline stuff. I mean, you go through all those things, but I think that the other thing about my mom and those conversations and teaching me all that stuff is that you also learn, um, you also learn to adjust and to adapt, right? Because in order for you, because some, you know, in order for you to argue your point, one has to be able to think pretty quickly, right? Because it's not like my mom wasn't offering me rebuttals. Right. One, one has to learn to critically think. You have to adjust. You have to pivot and adapt. Right. And I think most of my life has been just that. I think I, I think I'll, I think that until I, I mean, seventh grade or eighth grade, I think it was when, you know, you got you get to middle school. I was being teased for all these reasons. My mother was trying to stop the teasing. And so she trying to buy me name brand clothing. And, you know, you do all that, the, the stuff. Right. The signals of whatever the currency of cool is. You try to figure out how to drape yourself in those things to keep the to keep the boogeyman away, even though the boogeyman, they're all the same insecure kids that I was, you know, it's just a weird pecking order that's created, you know? And so my mom, tries, <laughs> you know, you know, so my mom tries to, to do that because she loves me and wants to protect me from that stuff. And then eighth grade came and I was like, nah, I don't really want to do all that anymore. I don't want to wear all that, you know, fortitude already there, enough fortitude to tell my mother, I don't want to, I, you don't have to spend your money on this. I don't need these things. What's going to happen is I'm going to go into the school this year and I'm going to be myself and I'm going to let them laugh 
And then eventually they'll stop laughing and then they'll copy me. And that's what they did. And my mother's just sort of woman who was like, okay, I mean, she knew who she raised. She would tell me when I got to high school, it got worse. And she would tell me like, look, kid, you out in the street all night, you doing the things that you do. I was, I was still a regular teenage boy. Like, like I tell the story not to exceptionalize myself. I was still a knucklehead teenage boy who got into all the things that knucklehead teenage boys get into. All of them, right? <laughs> yeah. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And my mother would say, yeah, but I gave you, I gave you a constitution. I gave you fortitude early in your life. So her prayer was always that, like, look, just don't just make it home. Because she always knew that at the end of the day, I, w- I would mature and grow up and, and you work through it. But the foundation was so strong. She knew that there was only so far I would go, that there was no pressure. There was no peer pressure strong enough to push me over the line. And she was right. I would get I would get to the line for sure. Mm-hmm. But I was always like, nah, like, I, and I knew how to express myself. I knew how to say, nah, I'm not interested. I knew how to say, nah, I'm afraid. That scares me. I don't want to do that. And I could say that to my friends. And because my friends were all being raised by this same woman, because my mom's house was the community house, they knew who I was and how I moved and how I spoke and how we got down. So when I expressed anxiety, my friends who were raised by the same woman were like, well, Jay, don't do that. It's cool. He's not going to do it. So I never had to worry about having to put on fake faces and, 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 and false armor. I never had to do all of that, thankfully, because she affected the whole community. Hmm. Again, I'm excavating this because these, uh, I think this is, has to be so core to what has made your work. Yes. I don't know, numerous New York Times bestsellers. How many, 14, 15 books? What do you got now? <laughs> I mean, 17, you 17. lose track after a dozen? Uh, I mean, yeah. 17, <laughs> it's up there. It's up there, man. I don't know. Well, to be that prolific, and I think these these building blocks, this is what I'm, I'm why I'm, I'm so interested in your past. And I... I I'm aware that there was some anxiety yeah. in your childhood, even even as a, an adult. I think you've I've heard you talk a little bit about it, but I'm I think the my understanding of your interpretation of that is fascinating. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit of that with mm. our our listeners and watchers. You know, I um I never had a name for my anxiety until I was 25. I had it my whole life. And I think it, you know, I, I was, I, so <laughs> the other part about my mom and my family, I was raised with by, by, by a bunch of women and they were a bunch of Southern black women raised in a very tough time, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, my mom is 76, so she lived through all the things. And mm-hmm. um, because of that, though she was really progressive in certain ways and in most ways, she also was hardened by life and a lot of other ways. And all of her sisters and their children, which are all women, nieces and cousins, who all raised me, the youngest one, who was a very sensitive boy. Uh, And so a lot of my life (laughs) was sort of trying to figure out how to avoid the wrath of my household, let alone the wrath from outside of it. So like, yes, my mom and I had this lovely thing, but she could just as easily, and she understood this, she understood this and she tried her best not to not to lean into it, but she understood that it only took a look to break me down. It only took, you know, my mom telling me she's disappointed in me was brutal. It was brutal for me because of because of the because of this sort of empathetic nature that I that I had back as a child and still have as an adult. And so my anxiety, with the way I think about my anxiety, is that it's rooted to it's it's rooted in my empathy. It's rooted in my ability to feel. Um, to feel my feelings and to feel the feelings around me. I mean, my writing began, my, 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 the reason I even started writing is because I heard my mother crying when I was 10 years old mm. for the first time because her mother had died. Mm. And I could not bear the sound of my mother's, the, the sound of my mother wailing in the bathroom, my ear to the door. I never heard anything like it. I can still remember the way it, fe- the way it felt in my own body to hear my mother cry, right? Chemically changing. And so I started to write. I wrote a few words, hopefully to make her feel better. And she printed those words on the funeral program. And that was the beginning of this whole thing, 
right? It's always been rooted in the feelings, in my own emotions and in the emotions of the people around me. But it is caused, right, that that is coming out of an anxious place or something or whatever we call anxiety. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've learned to wield it differently. I've learned to understand it differently. I know that pang I get in my stomach. I know what it is. Um, it's like it's like my spidey sense, you know. I know that it mm-hmm. that it, it it means that I feel something good or bad, or something that is possible, or something that might be coming, or that I'm on the phone or talking to a friend who's going through a tough time, and I can I can carry that weight with me. Um, and it's not always a healthy thing, right? Like I, I got therapists and medicine and all the things to to keep me on a level because nobody deserves to carry all that weight. Um, but I don't. But but I see it. Uh, I see it as more of a blessing than a burden. I feel like it makes me one of the one of the most human of the humans. Um, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. I manage it, right? But um, mm-hmm. but I'm grateful for it because it allows me it allows me. Uh, uh, the ability to teleport into an 11 year old space the ability to teleport into a 14 year old dealing with his own insecurities um a 16 year old trying to figure out sexuality right it allows me to the, it, it it basically gives me my own sort of emotional and mental spaceship to go to go anywhere in the in, in, in the in the emotional galaxy of our children uh, and so i who am i to sort of to sort of shun it you know how do you I think this is this is fascinating. It was one of the core things I wanted to learn from you today, it, and I think this is is a helpful narrative because you know you can read the read the studies. Anxiety at an all time high, uh, and whether that's just a, a diagnosis and it's been this way forever, or it, it really is a more anxious time. I think it's probably connected to how fast information moves today relative to all previous times on the planet. But how do you manage it? Because right now there's someone who's listening. They're on a walking trail somewhere on the subway. Yeah. They're like, I would love to be able to look at my anxiety in the way that Jason Reynolds looks at his. Yeah. So help <laughs> help us. Well, you know, I, I don't I don't pretend to have those answers, man, but I I think it's first of all, I think it's okay to not look at it the way I look at mine. I think it's okay to say that this is a severe mental uh, difference that that has caused me some 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 turmoil, right? Like, not everybody's going to see it as a superpower, and honestly, not everybody has to. Um, and and the reason why I want to make sure I say that is because sometimes I think we, by trying to upend our stuff, we sometimes can come across as a bit flippant because people are really struggling. Right. And yeah. I mean, very much so. And I'm fortunate that mine isn't as severe as others. Right. Mine is rough, mm-hmm. but it isn't. I've, I've, you know, it could be absolutely debilitating. And so for those people, I say you have every right to be upset and frustrated and angry and angry. It's OK. Like I like like, like I said earlier. Right. Our feelings are our feelings. Our feelings are our feelings. That being said, um, for me, uh, therapy has been amazing. Um, figuring out what my triggers are over the years, right? I know what it is. I know what's causing, what what might cause the spiral. Um, I'll tell you, I'll share something with you, you know. God, I hope my mother doesn't hear this because she's going to lose it, but it's okay. And we'll, we'll just talk about it. But a couple of weeks ago, I went to the doctor because I thought I was having a heart attack. I'm 38 years old. I live a fairly healthy lifestyle, considering. Um, but I felt like I was, I was, I was on my way out of here. And so I get to the doctor, and I'm, I'm freaking out. And the doctor says, "Okay, Jason, you're not having a heart attack." <laughs> That's the first thing he says. He's like, "Look, first thing first, you're not having a heart attack." He said, "Honestly, dude." Like, you know this about yourself. You know your anxiety lives in sort of your belly. Mine lives in my belly, right? And so the gastro issues that my anxiety has caused, causes, uh, has, has now worked its way through other parts of my body. And it felt like it was just sitting on my chest, right? And he said, this is coming from the pressure of your life, the stress of your life. And he said, so 
you have medicine that I try not to take, um, but I do have medicine. If I need to, I'll take it. But I've always tried to find other ways to work to work through it, me personally, right? By the way, for those who take medicine, what a gift. What a gift. This is not me. I think medicine is, because re- it's all chemical stuff, right, happening in our brain. So right. but for the medicine takers, please take your meds. Please take your meds, right? Do what works for you. But my doctor told me, he said, look, here's what we're going to do. I want you to, first of all, he told me that I, I could only have two drinks a day from here on out, which for a writer is uh, uh, terrible news. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. I'm just sitting there doing the math like, oh, man, I hope I don't go see that doctor. <laughs> absolutely devastating. <laughs> <laughs> but then he also said, he said, how many days do you exercise? I said, I exercise about three to four days a week. He said, all right, well, now it's six to seven. He said, we're going to push your body so that it frees your mind. Mm-hmm. So that's where I am. So right now I have I have therapy. I have exercise. I'm taking up fishing uh, because I need to create a disconnect and an escape from... You know, we talk about those books and all the New York Times bestsellers list, but boy, do have they come at a tremendous cost, mm-hmm. a tremendous cost. Everyone else, what everyone else is impressed with is killing me, Chase. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not normal or natural or sustainable, impressive as it may be. Um, and so fishing is the next thing on my docket. I'm going to learn how to do that and take some time to do that. Uh, and, and. You know, and lastly, just do my best to like journal and write in my journal and remember what I'm grateful for outside of writing. Right. Mm -hmm. I write for a living. but I'm very careful about calling myself a writer because I don't want to attach this thing that I love so much to my identity just in case I have to let it go someday. Um, so I, I, so I journal and I whoa. do other things to, to, to stay on the level, man. So yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to stop. We got to put a pin in that. Yeah. So what I understand is the identity actually uh and people see that as something that helps them it it orients them right if i can say i am x or y or z and we we attach you know some of these labels are false some of them are narratives we tell ourselves that we're not really their (laughs) aspirations but your willingness to not attach your identity to your work can you say more about that yeah, you know, I, I, the first time I thought about this was when Whitney Houston died. Uh, <laughs> you know, Whitney Houston's nickname was The Voice. That's what they called her. Her whole life, she was called The Voice. And then Whitney Houston, through whatever it was, whether it be through abuse or whether it be simply by the natural course of aging, the voice begins to change. And so what happens when the voice can't sing? anymore what darkness lies on the other side of that when all you've ever known yourself to be is the voice i'm not i'm not the voice i'm jason my mama's son who writes for a living and who writes um, because he loves it but not because it is attached to his identity no 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 because one day i may have nothing else to say one day uh, I might want to try something. You know, I love furniture, Chase. I might want to become a furniture designer. I might want to put my stories in physical objects, right? Create new narrative around what it takes to make something from a piece of wood in these hands. It might not be words on the page anymore, right? I love it. And can I look, it, it, I'd be disingenuous if I said to you that I imagine myself quitting, right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that life is funny, Mm. It, right and, and, and unpredictable funny so, weird not funny haha all the funny time weird, right, right. <laughs> yeah, funny <laughs> weird and i don't want to ever be the person who suddenly cannot do the thing anymore and feels like he lost himself i don't want to be i don't want to do that man we see it happen to athletes all the time their whole lives they've been basketball players not people athletes and the moment that the, that, 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 that the game is over, they don't know who they are. Matter of fact, we see it happen to mothers even more often. Right? Little boy, little girl finally is grown, is going to leave the nest. Mom hasn't been, mom has only been mom. Mom hasn't been herself, though, for 18, 19 years. 
and now has to figure out who she is all over again. We see it happen, right? So for me, I'm just like, let me be a little more preemptive and thoughtful and self-aware about the realities of that and be very careful about how I talk about myself as it pertains to this work. I do this as a, this is what I do. This is not who I am. Who are you then? What, what is it? What is it? You said I'm my mama's son. Like what is that? Is that based on all the, the effective programming that you have? I could see how that would work for you, but leave others feeling vapid because so many people are just an, an accumulation of all the things that they've done. And so what is, what is a, in your mind, a healthy construct for who we are, if we're not a writer, a photographer, a designer, a entrepreneur, what, what, what are some, I mean, I think I know, but I don't know if I have the courage to just stay, stand in that as my thing. That sounds scary as hell. Hey man, uh, you know, I think ego, ego, bro. <laughs> oh, 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 massive, right? <laughs> but you know, so the, you know, and that's a, and that's a very real thing. I think for me, I am who I am most in the shower, and I always think about this all the time. <laughs> I think about this all the time. You know, like who are we? Who are we? Who you are in the shower? Like that's who you are, right? In the shower, I feel like I'm a. In the shower, I feel like I, I think about this all the time. I'm a person who um, is detail oriented, right? I'm a person who doesn't take himself very seriously. I'm a person who loves to hear his own voice, for better or for worse, right? I'm a person who needs and values and requires relaxation. Right? I'm a per- like I think about the shower all the time as a metaphor of like perhaps our personal identities in its most distilled form. Is it the only way? Of course not. But 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 the but the concept or the idea is like who are you when no one is there? Who are you? Because if you're asking me, like I'm I'm all sorts of people. I'm I'm all kinds. Of, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an amalgamation of many many things and many many people in many many places. Right? Every single thing that I've ever experienced has stuck on me, and has stuck in me. Right? And most of those things have nothing to do with my work. I'm like I am the kid who who tried to figure out how to pop a wheelie at, at at six years old. I'm the kid whose parents split, but he got to watch his parents remain friends. I'm the kid who wanted to be his father because his father was a bad boy, and who wanted to be his mother because his mother was like a, a professional person and 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 seemed to have a grasp on a spirituality that no one else seemed to understand. I'm the kid who uh, who's who's who who was very 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 popular for good reasons and bad reasons as a very young person and so therefore had to had to contest and deal with his ego much younger than most people would have to right i was on the cover of a newspaper at the washington post when i was like 15 right and so you're dealing with like ego <laughs> you're dealing so you're dealing, unchecked <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, it's wild right you're dealing with ego very early and therefore like and so you know the ugliness of it all very very early in life and so you run from it for the rest of your life, right? You work hard to try to run away from it for the rest of your life, right? Like I'm all of those things. Writing is a very small part of that when I really think about it. As a matter of fact, the only reason the writing exists is because I'm telling all the stories from all of that stuff. Without without, without who I am, the writing don't exist. So we, we take the, So we take the thing that means the least and strap it to ourselves as if it's the most. When really the only reason it exists in the first place is because the actual most makes it so, right? So like, that's who I am. That's who we all are. Chase Jarvis is not Chase Jarvis because of the podcast and his ability to ask questions. Chase Jarvis is Chase Jarvis, who is the person who was curious enough to even start a podcast in the first place. Hmm. I'm going to have to go away and get back to you on that one. That's some heavy <laughs> shit right <there. laughs> <laughs> and I and I like the sh- I I like the shower bit too. Who are you with the shower? <laughs> There's nothing. You don't have any clothes on, even exactly. You don't have any clothes. On. We and we do all sorts of things in the shower that people don't know. Chase, all <laughs> secret of secret life. We have secret <laughs> lives, as my mother used to say. There are three lives that every individual has: your public, your private, and your secret. And it's that secret one we try to pretend don't exist. But that's who we are. And that's amazing, amazing fertile ground for storytelling. And you've done that so, so effectively. Makes me want to point to uh, 
recent recent work ain't burned all the bright yeah uh, i i don't even know what that is Maybe i mean not. can you try and describe it i mean this is so this is a very seductive piece of art it's collaboration between yourself and a buddy jason griffin um how do you describe it to i mean we're on a podcast here right we're like people are either listening to us maybe some people are going to watch this but that how do you how do you explain what it is i mean it's in a book form right it's a package but i've heard you describe it as, as three long run-on sentences but but that, that's what I, it is I, that's what it is like that's, that's what it is in form three run-on sentences uh mashed up against a landscape of hundreds and hundreds of pieces of art i've been thinking about ways to describe it music makes the most sense we usually use jazz as our metaphor, but I actually think this is more of an, or an orchestral suite. Mm. To think of it as an orchestral suite, right? To think of it as movements, three different movements of a symphony. And the first sentence or the first movement of the symphony is all about the murder of George Floyd, the racial uprising of 2020, um, young people who were crying out you know, the, the constant sort of turning over of, of the racial reckoning in this country, right? The constant sort of retelling of, of that painful soil. Mm -hmm. And it's sweeping and it's personal and it's narrative and it's rooted in a family. Um, it feels familiar. It feels distant. It feels sometimes a little too close, right? It's all these sorts of things. It's a, it's a movement, right? The second sort of movement, the second part of the suite, uh, it sort of sort of winds and weaves through our the, the melee that was COVID, and it talks about a father who is coughing. The same family, same group of people, and, and and it's a father, and he's coughing, and he has COVID, and it's all about sort of trying to figure out how to love and care for a person that I can no longer touch. And then the final suite, right, the coda of the of the symphony is all about you know. Basically, that these two things, amongst other things, like the L.A. wildfires and all sorts of things in 2020, that these things were all, um, that they were all attacking our respiratory systems, right? Whether it be the tear gas in the street or the way that George Floyd was murdered, whether it be what COVID was actually doing, which was attacking the lungs, right? For 2020 and 2021, we were all suffocating. We were suffocating physically. We were suffocating emotionally. We were suffocating socially. Right. Air was being stripped from us in every single way. And the question was, where does one find an oxygen mask? And so the, the coda of the symphony, this last sort of bit of the suite, this last sort of movement is all about where one finds an oxygen mask. And the answer that we all realized, and hopefully at least many of us in 2020 and 2021, is that the, the true beauty in our lives were in the boring bits. Right. Like that. What a gift it is to give a hug to someone you love, something we took for granted. What a gift it is to 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 get to shake somebody's hand. Right. I don't want to give fist bumps. I'm not interested in, in in closing my hand to greet you. That doesn't do it for me. Right. Like these sorts of what it means to walk around with to see a person smile, a very small detail that we've been robbed of for two years. And how that's where our oxygen is. And so now we know that we can perhaps start to give ourselves a bit more of it or at least pay attention to it differently as time goes on. You know, so that's what it is, man. I mean, you know, it's a trip. I'm, I'm grateful to have made the thing. I, I don't know if I thought it would be what it became, but, you know, that's the beauty of art, right? Pure genius. So, Thanks, so fascinating. And that was... I have not heard you describe it like that before. I've listened and watched and read a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's very, I never very, had. That's very, a new one. That's for you, Chase. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of gratitude, grateful. Um, I want to shape the last piece of our conversation around, there were a couple uh, people besides your parents that I understood were impactful for you. And I want to understand this uh, and have you talk a little bit about it because it seems profound. It seems like, we all ought to, we all have these people in our lives. We ought to look for them mm. and pay attention to them and also try to become them. 
hmm. for others. Uh, yeah. And these are a couple of teachers that you mentioned. One was the first person who saw potential in your writing. Yeah. And the second was a person that uh, you described him in such a way um, <laughs> as almost evil genius. Uh, <laughs> and and I'm hoping you could close it sort of the, the description of these two people and the roles that they played for you with the story of the fish. Yeah, I am. Um, I had this teacher, Miss Blaufus. Um, this was 10th grade English. I took her class. I, I remember the first day because she was in young. She was probably 25. Gosh, 24, 25. Fresh out of Princeton. And was teaching this class. And I knew from the very first day that I had to get out of that class. Um, I knew. I remember going. <laughs> I remember going home and sitting with my mom. I walk in the door. My mom's at the kitchen table. And I say, you got to you got to transfer me out of this class. There's no way you can let me stay. And she's like, why? I'm like, this teacher is so mean and she's, I cannot do it. She's too strict. She's too rigid. And I just didn't like anything that was restrictive in any way. Right. So I'm just like, she's too like hard. She's too, you know, all the things that teenagers whine about. Right. <laughs> and my mother's like, eh, nah, I don't know. If that's a, I don't know if that's a good enough reason for me to transfer you out of the class, Jason. I'm like, why would you want me to be in a class with a teacher that's mean? Why would you want me to like go through this? And she's like, Jason, I just don't, you know, as we as we work it out together, right? She's like, I just don't think that your argument is compelling enough for me to transfer you out of a class just because she's a little, because she's difficult. It's the first day. You haven't even had any class, <laughs> right? No. <laughs> But you know, you can recognize these people, right? You're like, oh God, this is going to be tough. I feel like, <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, by the end of this semester, having stuck it out, she ended up becoming a tremendous gift. She was the first teacher to recognize that I had any kind of ability as a writer. She was the first teacher to, um, <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't do good in her class. I didn't do well in her class. Right. I, I, I probably got like a, you know, a C or something like that. C minus, who knows? But she would always give me my papers back and she'd tell me uh, what I did right. She'd tell me what she saw in the work, even though I didn't get a good grade. Even though, And she'd say, like, you, got, you didn't get a good grade because you don't follow directions. But your ability, I can recognize you have talent. You just don't, you just want to do what you want to do, right? You want to, you don't want to follow my directions. You want to write what you want to write. You want to write it how you want to write it. But I would be, it would be, it would be destructive for me to not at least tell you that like you have something. As a matter of fact, she saw it so clearly that she even started a creative writing class um, halfway through the year, actually, and only took eight students that she wanted to work with, myself being one of them. And gave and gave a special special instruction to help us learn all the different poetic forms and all sorts of things that I will forever be grateful for. As a matter of fact, she even told my mother um, at a football game or something, homecoming or something. She said, "Look, when he starts applying for colleges, try to get him into a school with a good writing program. Like he's got the, whatever it is, he's got the thing." Um, so I'll always be grateful for, yeah. And she's still a very, she, she lives down the street from me. She's still a very good friend of mine. And, uh, and, uh, as a matter of fact, for all of you who listen, who are listening, if you read Spider-Man, she's the teacher. And I mean, her name is even in the, Miss Blauf is the teacher. That's right. That is, yeah. Yeah. Who's right. teaching a poetry lesson and all of that. Yeah. She, uh, that is, that is the real Miss Blauf uh, a, a, a gift that I'll, I'll never be able to repay her. Um, and then the second teacher was Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, uh, who's also still a very good friend of mine, he was unlike any human I've never met. Not just a teacher. like I've never met a person like Mr. Williams. He looked different than everybody. He had like a, 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 a stark white bowl cut. <laughs> and he wore, he wore <laughs> flattering, flattering description. Of it. But he also does had he know like you a, talk about him like this? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He knows. Okay. You know, he had stark white bowl cut. He had an earring. He had. Um, he always was pretty clean shaven, and he wore like uh, a button up shirt with these weird ties, and he wore sneakers, and you know he would find like old Jordans and thrift stores and all kinds of stuff. Like he was just a straight. He wore bracelets and rings and. He was sort of a, an eccentric, not even sort of, he was an eccentric man. Um, he had this incredible voice that was, yeah, he, yeah, I don't know. He was just different, Chase. He was different in lots of ways. 
And one day in class, he and he, he taught a class called Global Studies. And as a matter of fact, the first day of class, the first thing you learn is the word ethnocentric, right? What does it mean to be ethnocentric, right? This is the first thing wow. you learn. This, I always tell people, this is the man who taught me how to be a human in the world. Right. My mom gave me the tools to sort of have like an internal humanity. But this is the man who taught me how to be a human in the world. Um, and I'll never forget it. Ethnocentricity. What does that mean? You know, uh, that one sees themselves and their ethnicity as the center point of the world. When really, obviously, everybody, there are many, many cultures that are different. Right. And how dangerous it is to be ethnocentric. Um, this is what he taught us at the beginning. I mean, he fed us crickets because he wanted us to know that somewhere in the world, this is a cuisine. Right? And this is a delicacy. He uh, showed us slides of his travels around Mogadishu and, and Rwanda and Shanghai. And I mean, like this dude was just, we had never seen, we had never known anyone who had done what he'd done and been where he'd been and seen what he'd seen. And he took a liking to us. He loved the teaching. And he wanted to give that to a whole bunch of little black kids who didn't, most of whom never left their neighborhoods. Right? One day we come to class and he, he has a fish. And he says, this is going to be the class pet. Now, for context, this is my senior year, right? So we're like, <laughs> we passed the class <laughs> pet phase in our lives. Yeah, this is like, that's like sixth grade shit. That's, right yeah, there. that's very young, right? <laughs> right. So we're like, bro, we're, I, we don't need no class pet, but okay. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, just, you know, humor me. This is your class pet. I need you all to name it. We name it Confucius. I don't know why, but we do. Uh, and and we feed it every day. And he says, I want you to feed it, but here's the deal. I don't want you to ever put your hands in this tank. If you put your hands in the tank or if you touch the fish, by it, for it, no matter what the reason is, if you touch this fish, because I know how, you know how teenagers can be, right? If you touch this fish, then you're going to be suspended, no questions asked. So don't touch the fish. No fingers on the fish. Okay, Mr. Williams, whatever you say. A month goes by. Or so. off, yeah. yeah, of course. Like, whatever. Some, some time goes by, a month or so, and he comes to class and he walks over to that tank and he takes the fish out of the tank and he puts it on the floor. And he does it so matter of factly that nobody knows what to do or what to say or what to think. But we all get up and we're moaning and groaning and we're wondering what in the world he's thinking. And he just kind of stands there and watches as we gather around the fish and the fish is flopping and gasping for air. And we're watching this fish die. And finally, after a few seconds that felt like minutes, these two young ladies go and they scoop up the fish and they toss it back in the tank and the fish survives. And we're like, whew, thankfully, that, that was a close one. And Mr. Williams, as calm as can be, looks at those two young ladies and he says, all right, well, the two of you, you know, get your backpacks and head on down to the principal's office because you're suspended. And they're like, we're suspended for what? We just saved the fish. Why are we suspended? What did we do wrong? And he said, well, the rules are the rules. I told you a long time ago that if you put your fingers on the fish, if you touch the fish, for whatever reason, that unfortunately you would be punished. There would be disciplinary action. You are suspended. Don't bother fighting me on it. You just head on down to the principal's office. And they're like cussing them out. They're angry. You know, the whole thing. And he sticks his head out the door and he says, but hold your heads up because you did the right thing. But sometimes doing the right thing has has consequences. And the rest of us had to sit in class, myself especially. I can only speak for me. I sat there with, with the cowardice churning in my stomach. Uh, and I vowed to always save the fish from here on out. I think about that story all the time, a few times a week at least. Right, that every day of my life is a day where I'm probably going to have to make the decision to save the fish. I also think about it because the two girls who saved the fish are indicative of the world we live in. It is always the girls who save the fish. Always you know, women. It is always the women in our lives and in our world who sacrifice their bodies and their comfort, who sacrifice their freedom for the betterment of, of, of the rest of us. And they rarely get any credit for it. Um, those are the things that I think about. Those are the things that he taught me. He's the funny. I'll tell you one quick funny thing about him, and and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll I'll shut up. But I, I saw him recently. I went to his beach house, and which he spends all summer at. You know, he's retired now. He's still the same old troublemaker. <laughs> and I'm down there. We're on the beach, man. We're like sitting there chilling, having a couple of drinks, you know, and, and reminiscing. And he said, "You know, Jason, and he's very, very shy, very modest." He hates the fact that I that I've told the story that that so many people around the world know this story. Um, 
he's very modest, but he said, you know, Jason, I, I've been meaning to talk to you to tell you that recently, maybe a couple years ago, somebody came to see him. This is before he quit school, before he retired. Someone came to see him, a young lady, and they walk in this classroom and they're catching up. And she says, I have something, I have something to show you. And she pulled out the disciplinary referral that she kept. This is not the one. This is not the one from my class. This is from some other some other class, some other person who's gone through the, the fish. And she pulls it out and says, I was one of the ones who saved the fish and kept the referral, the suspension referral, kept it all those years. I was one of the ones who saved the fish. Can you imagine? And he said he just he just he cried and he just got emotional. I, yeah, I got uh, my hair is standing up on my whole body. It's amazing. It's amazing. So shout out to Mr. Williams, Dr. Chris, as he goes by now, um, for teaching me, uh, for teaching me the value and sacrifice for teaching me. And I'll tell you one last thing, Chase, that, that ties this all together. Um, and it's about my upbringing again. But this time it's not about my mother and what she taught me. It's about my father and what he taught me and what he used to say to round this all out. What he used to say is... When it comes time to give, make sure to give the things that you want, never the things that you don't want. He said, the reason why is because if you give the things you want and not the things you don't want, then you will know the difference between empathy and sympathy. You will know the difference between sacrifice and charity. And so when I think about saving the fish, <laughs> I think about saving the fish, when I think about giving of myself, when I think about laying it on the line and giving the things that I want, right, which is my time and my freedom and my comfort, um, I, I, I will think about my mother and my father and Mr. Williams uh, for the rest of my life. We have the courage to save the fish. Do that. That is such a powerful. I don't know how you can experience that and not have that stay with you forever. Forever. I, wow. Well, thank you for doing the work to save the fish, uh, putting it on the line. Uh, I think it's incredibly inspirational the, how you've decided to spend your time and your perspective is it's, um, it's very unique, very, uh, feels just welcomed, welcoming, um, I'm, I'm grateful for you and the work you put out in the world. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And again, uh, you've got 17 books. We've already established that most recently ain't burned all the bright staggering work of genius and highly, highly recommended. And is there anywhere else you want us to go to pay attention to your work, Jason? This community is really supportive of the creators that we have on the show. We're, We'll be, you know, buying the book that came out earlier this year and others. Anywhere else you'd want to point us uh, to to uh, stay connected? Yeah, yeah. You can find me on all the things at at, at Jason Reynolds eighty um, three, and my website is is Jason Reynolds Books. Um, oh, no, it's not. It's Jason Writes Books. I think. <laughs> I, I, who knows? I think it's JasonWritesBooks dot com. <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, <laughs> but stick up with me, stay up with me, Chase, man. I appreciate you giving me a couple minutes of your time and allowing me a moment to to, to share some space with you. So grateful. Uh, and I would like to take a minute to acknowledge the audience. Thanks again for paying attention. Please dig into Jason Works. Totally extraordinary. Uh, I'm, again, grateful. I'm looking forward to the next piece of work. And until then, and to everybody out there in the world, from both Jason and I, we bid you all a good day. Day.